welcome to uh, DPE Lowdown, Dev Prod Eng Lowdown. We call uh, Dev Prod Engineering DPE, and um, we've been doing these webcasts for years to and talking to folks like John, who are experts in the industry, for, to get a, the lowdown on how John and his team have been doing some really cool stuff in Develop Productivity Engineer for their customers, for the industry and whatnot. So it's a deeper dive into developer productivity engineering case that is use cases that you can hopefully learn from and and, and try out and learn about new tools and, and whatnot. I'm Bruce from Gradle. We also have Clay on my team, on the Gradle team. He's he's helping us out with the Q&A and he has the, he's on the Develocity, formerly Gradle Enterprise Engineering team. So he's going to He's helped uh, John and team get some stuff set up that he's going to talk about as 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 well here. John, yeah, my old pal. I, you know, when did we first meet? Uh, when did you join Gosh. Netflix? Probably 2014, right? So it's 10 years. T about 10 wow. years now. Right? Yeah, about about 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're the CEO of Modern. You're then co-founder co of Modern, and it's the company behind Open Rewrite and uh, yeah. Uh, before we, we we jump into that, the you know, obviously I know what what you're doing, but the one thing in the industry that you got a lot of great press out of it, and it could kind of help set you know what is open rear, what is modern, was that you know Andy Jess, the CEO of Amazon, um, Adam, uh, uh, and he at Amazon reinvent. He was talking about Amazon Q code and he was mentioning, this is his quote, 1000 applications upgraded in two days. And that was how they're, you know, a part of that uses open rewrite and whatnot. Tell us a bit about that exciting news. You know, I mean, it's a big thing. Reinvent is huge. And for you to be mentioned there, kind of give us the story from there and what open rewrite is and what modern does yeah absolutely i mean pull back the curtain a little bit i mean we didn't even know amazon was working um really with open rewrite until the wednesday before thanksgiving right the week before aws reinvent and i get a text from miles or like aws rep and he's like i hey man i like i really need you to be on this meeting later today and i thought well that's a little weird right like i'm not now, you, you know, I'm a, I'll be on meetings, but like, you know, it's weird that I was like getting a text from him. I really need you to be here. And we join and there's like a group of, of folks from Amazon ready to kind of say, you know, hey, just so you know, like, you know, we kind of built on top of open rewrite. We did some things internally. We're going to announce it at, at reInvent next week. It, you know, hopefully you're okay with that. Um, you want to put a quote in our blog post. And I honestly think there was a bit of apprehension on, on their part. I think they're used to this, like... Um, you know, kind of building on top of open source tools and that not being necessarily received really well. But in our case, I thought, you know, it's perfect. It's great. It's exactly what we want to take that really like Apache licensed recipe out there, like Java 8 to 17 in their case, and just, you know, go make hay with it, right? You know, go go, uh, go update your apps. Well, uh, amazing. And tell us a bit about your your company, Modern, because we're going to refer to Modern. We're going to refer Absolutely. to Open Rewrite. You know, we are Gradle. We have... Gradle build tool, the open source project. We have Gradle right. Enterprise. We changed it to Develocity. What's that relationship yeah. and how does that work? We're going to talk about all of these things. Yeah. So, I mean, Open Rewrite is the is the kind of core refactoring engine, you can say, um, that's, that's really built to do big mass code changes, whether that be Java 8 to 17, whether it be fixing vulnerabilities, whether that be fixing like old, like SaaS type issues, a lot of different use cases, but Modern is like uh, doing that at massive scale. So taking those open rewrite recipes and applying them and developing them on hundreds or thousands of repositories at a time. So it's a kind of classic, you know, the commoditize your complement, you know, we provide a refactoring engine in open source and then Modern is like a, like a distributed data warehouse for code executing those across uh, a whole code base. And, and I love telling great stories. And when you and I chatted before this event, uh, you know, we're going to show some stuff later of, of yeah. exactly how some of this worked, but, I, but I'd love to start out with great stories. So you, you and team very similar to our Develocity and what I do, you're going around to these large organizations, these large software Absolutely. organizations, 
and helping them with developer productivity, modernizing their code base, tech debt, you could even call it, right? Yeah. And one story that you and Pat were telling me to got to start with that was this very large insurance company. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm reading Pat's quote here. You know, it was about, you know, Spring for shell vulnerability mm -hmm. hit, and they had to update all these what they call maintenance stories. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. and and you all were were able to tell me, tell us tell us how all that became. What was the need? Tell us a bit more about that because I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting company in particular, this insurance company. They had their backlog and, you know, their typical agile shop, you know, everything's in the backlog, story points assigned. But there was one more thing. They had every story in the backlog tagged with either maintenance or, you know, business feature, right? Like business requested feature. I think the word maintenance is actually a really interesting word that they chose, not technical debt, because, you know, the, the word technical debt used to really have this meaning of like something I imposed upon myself. Like I took a shortcut intentionally to get something out the door. I'm going to have to go down and pay down that debt at some point. But what's interesting, you know, with like modern software, we're building on a bunch of open source and third party stuff. You have to right, to ship new experiences quickly. But that stuff shifts on its own. Right. Like, I mean, you, you don't have control over that. So just by building this, you know, software production is very industrialized. It requires maintenance on the back end. So they really recognize that maintenance and, and SMRs or uh, business features. And, um, you know, they, if you kind of look back at them quarter to quarter, like, you, you know, over the years, there was one product team that delivered a certain amount of business functionality and a tiny amount of maintenance every quarter. And that's just how it went. You know, they were really good about estimating how many storage points they could do on each. And somewhere in that like Q2 when log for shell hit, they did a less business delivery and more maintenance that court, right? Because they had to go and switch off and go fix all this stuff across all their apps. So it was really mechanical work, but that, they had to do it. Then at the end of that year, they had started with Modern. They were starting to like fix these maintenance stories with recipes that would just make the change across all their repositories. Well, that was closing maintenance stories a whole lot faster than it used to be. So interestingly, their maintenance work for that quarter went up by like a thousand percent and their business functionality delivery went up by 30% because the teams weren't switching off of business value delivery to go do this kind of grunt work maintenance on the side. The funny thing is when that, when they did that, that team guy kind of went to the business and reported their, their uh, performance for the quarter. The business actually kind of got mad initially. They're like, why can't I take that big maintenance bar and stack it on top of the business one? Like, and they're like, oh, no, 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 wait, I wasn't doing that stuff by hand, right? I was, I was doing that maintenance with automation instead. So that's, I think that's a really interesting forward thinking uh, way of, of, of viewing maintenance versus business delivery in their case. And where did uh, Modern and Open Rewrite play a role in that? So it's when they needed to update, you know, a, a dependency across their whole footprint. You know, you can do that commit all at once across a whole business unit rather than having to go to each repo and making that change one by one. You could fix, you know, a I'm trying to get rid of an old API and replace it with another. You write a recipe to do that. Then you just mass affect that change across the org. This is a company, by the way, that, uh, you know, years ago, they had like 70 engineers. They had like 40 repositories, you know, if, if we wind back 15 years ago. Today, they still have 70 engineers, roughly 3,000 repositories. And that's the pattern we see over and over again. It's just like explosion of code under maintenance. But, you know, the headcount isn't growing. So if you want to accomplish any one, you know, maintenance activity, you're going to have to do it across to so many more repositories. And, th and that's pretty impressive that, you know, tooling allows you to scale your business without having to yeah. increase engineering headcount. And that's so, right. so that's, that, that's, that's quite, that's quite impressive. And, you know, we're for, for our audience, right? Uh, maybe some of them aren't, familiar with open rewrite, not familiar with modern, how far does the open source open rewrite get you? 
And when do you need to yeah. kind of look at an enterprise solution? And and it's always a build versus buy kind of thing in the open source. Absolutely. Market, right. You know, Absolutely. I, I either got to build it myself or I got to buy yours or whatever something. Where, where, where does where does that kind of uh, happen? Let's think about this like in general as like tech stack liquidity. It's about being able to move, to not be ossified, to not be stuck on one thing. Now that could be a framework migration. That could be Java 8 to 17. I don't want to be stuck on Java 8. I want to move to Java 17. But it also could be, hey, I'm trying to move off of one IAM provider and onto another. I'm trying to move from one monitoring system vendor to another. And to accomplish that, I've got to go through my code. I've got to basically iterate over all my code and make these code changes all, all throughout the code base to do so. And so I think when you get, there's like different kinds of recipes. When it's like Java 8 to 17, that recipe is super well battle tested. We, you know, A lot of people have used that to great effect. And so and Amazon's able to take that one off the shelf, rip over a thousand repos, done, great. But Oftentimes we're going into environments and we're trying to do something unique. We're trying to do, I'm trying to kill an internal feature flagging system and go to launch darkly. I'm trying to move from this to that. And so that starts with the discovery exercise. That starts with a recipe that emits data, that does an impact analysis. I understand how things are used. And so having that engine to be able to execute that recipe at scale and iterate on it very quickly leads to a good outcome. At another bank, we were doing that IAM provider to IAM provider migration. And we just started looking at the whole set of code base in the commercial bank. And as we developed that recipe, we would run on the entire commercial bank. You know, and how, how effective is that recipe? Oh, we need to make this change to run it again, run it again, run it again. When, that's, when that feedback loop is only minutes, you can really kind of quickly get that new custom, you know, transformation done. Yeah, that's great. And a great segue into the next topic. Like I said, I love telling stories and hearing great yeah, stories because yeah. I'm out there in the trenches uh, yeah. dealing with some of this as well. There, you know, you and Pat mentioned, uh, and, and Pat works uh, uh, on John's team. She mentioned, yeah. hey, we're helping this large Canadian bank. And I guess uh, they ran sonar cube reports they identified a ton of security uh, vulnerabilities and security related issues and for them to manually fix those it could have taken years uh, uh it said 4.9 and- years of developer time to fix me oh yeah. that's what their tool told them isn't that crazy <laughs> yeah so then you just basically got to put everybody on that because you're a bank and it's security related yeah. and uh good luck don't. uh delivering any product or don't yeah yeah, and then and face the you know pay the piper someday when it comes. Like I think too often that's what happens is that you know there's just such a pile of work to do it just doesn't get done. So you know it's we we've it's it's cute to say shift left. It's the developer's responsibility to f- fix all these things. But when you keep shoveling things over onto their plate, like there's only so much they can do. You know they're you know it's kind of an heroic lift. It's too much. So tell us yeah, what happened at this the- bank. They ran the sonar cube reports. They identified some vulnerabilities. Yeah. When? Yeah. How did this come about, and and what happened yeah. next? I think this is a great way these things happen. Is like you run an existing scan tool like that. It reports a ton of work to do. Like let's just pick the top five things, top five security things that this is reporting. We don't have to do everything today. Let's just pick the top five, and we say like, well, if we don't have recipes for these, let's develop another recipe for for these five. Right? It's only five. And for those five, it said 4.9 years of time to fix. There was, um, you know, so provided the recipes, they work, you know, they're available to commit. I like making the recipe available for product teams to run at a time that's convenient for them. Like they may be in the middle of a fire drill right now trying to get a feature out the door. You know, tomorrow they have more downtime. That product team needs to be able to execute that recipe at scale and do the commit. So at a, in a moment when they're not kind of like under the gun, they can they can get it done. And there was a developer in the back corner that just like mass committed the results of that recipe, like direct committed it to like hundreds of repos. And nobody knew he was doing that. Actually, like I didn't know he was doing that. And his boss came down and was like, what is going on down here? Like, who is this guy? Right? Because it's like, a, like a, one year out of school. And this kid's like quiet kid in the corner, just like makes a bunch of commits, right? And you can imagine if that's like hooked up to a, you know, a system internally, that's like so-and-so made a commit, so-and-so made a commit. So they're like, who, who is this guy, right? Like, you know, who's this like 
developer that's just like fixing this stuff across the whole whole you know wing of the company and you know you, can, you kind of got like this raised hand right i guess is me right so i think that's just beautiful i think that's how it should be yeah yeah absolutely. i love the time that he was yeah. young right like i think you get that young ambitious developer that like wants to make a mark they're going to make a mark and, and, and we talk about all the time right folks get used to the pain and uh, they get used to their ways, and it's really hard to uh, uh, get folks to to change. Um, I'm sure that developer got a nice uh, promotion, uh, right? Certainly on the radar yeah. of his boss yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know uh, that that's, yeah. that's 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 pretty awesome. Yeah. So so now we've told the stories. Kind of audience has got an idea of how these things could be used in the wild to handle tech debt to, yeah. you know, when you take a lot of this tech debt and some of it is high priority, you could you know, mention yeah. security related stuff and yeah. whatnot off folks' hands. This substantially improves developer productivity. You want, you yeah. want to show us something about open rewrite? And Mike, one question that yeah. I had, sorry, going off script a bit. No, when did no, you start working on, when did you start working on open yeah. rewrite? Yeah, a little history was this there. I mean, an I was... idea that came out of Netflix because you know, uh, it is. For folks who I mean, I, I might have forgotten to mention this at the beginning. John and I, Netflix, big Gradle shop. They use Devilocity, yeah, and my team and John, we were working very closely together for many years. The Nebula Gradle plugins and whatnot, yeah. that Even collaboration, yeah. that going to hanging out at the Netflix yeah. uh, Los Gatos office. Uh, yeah. You know, when in that, and you came to Gradle for a while and, and all that, yeah. when, when in this journey did, did the idea for Open Rewrite come about and when did you start working on it? Yeah, there's actually a connection to Gradle there. I mean, I was working on build tools at Netflix originally under, which is a subset of engineering tools in general, which is a central team. So build tools, we were, you know, one of the first things I did was help Rob Spieldener at the time move the remainder of Netflix's code base from Ant to Gradle, believe it or not. That's in 2014. Um, we were still kind of chewing through that. Um, but yeah, once everything got on Gradle, like there did become, you know, if we wanted to make a change in a Nebula plugin, we were trying to get people to do it. Like, you know, how do you spread that across, you know, tens of thousands of microservices? Like if you want to make some sort of change. And so we spent a lot of time, you know, like I spent a lot of time personally trying to build reports, like build like dashboards or like actionable insights for developers to know what we wanted them to do, like colorizing Jenkins output, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And it resulted in like basically no action on the part of product engineers. There was freedom and responsibility culture at Netflix, which was kind of special. So as a central team, I couldn't impose a constraint on what they did. I couldn't say like, if you don't, convert to, you know, great old X by this date, I'm going to break your build. No, that's anti-cultural. You have to find a way to help them move forward. And so reporting wasn't doing it, which I guess should be no surprise, but I mean, like I'm stubborn like everyone else. And I think when I, when I would ask people, what could I do? They would, they would always answer super sarcastically. They'd be like, well, do it for me. Otherwise I'm not going to do it. Right. I got something else to do, but there's only like three or four of us on the build tools team and there's like 700 of them. So, you know, that's not actionable. So we started thinking about like, just even in just the Gradle build, how would I automate this? So I created a tool called Gradle Lint over, I think like Christmas, 2015. Gradle Lint was really about making AST changes in Gradle groovy scripts to like push things forward a little bit. And then from there it was like, well, if we could do this in Gradle groovy, like what about the main source code? Like what, like, what if we could like make changes there too, right? And then so Open Rewrite was born out of that kind of incremental realization that, you know, we needed to find ways of like mass refactoring this code base. While you pull up something, you want to show us a quick demo and whatnot. Clay, any interesting questions uh, from the audience? And audience, you have a Q and A tool with your Zoom uh, that you can uh, yeah. ask us any question. Anything interesting from the audience? Let's take one, and then we can take more questions at the end of the Q and A section. So we, we don't have any yet, but I'm I'm watching it closely. So feel free to ask questions. I'll bring up the good ones. We'll discuss them live. Yeah. If we switch to a screen here, I think I would start with a particular change. This is JUnit 4 to 5, which, I mean, it's, I like this example because it's unit tests, right? It's like, it's a unit test. It's not my main production source code. 
that's actually like serving customer requests, you know, actually you deliver value to the business. It's unit tests. Now, unit tests are important, to, you know, obviously, but like not in the critical path. And yet I find it interesting that like Spring Boot 3, for example, you have to move to JUnit 5 in order to move to Spring Boot 3. You can't stay on JUnit 4. Like it's end of life, right? It's, it's done. And Spring Boot 2 is end of life now. So when I think about the reasons why people get stuck, why they have like thousands of apps still on Spring Boot 2, it can be silly things. It, it can be things like, well, I haven't like hand moved all of my JUnit 4 tests to JUnit 5. And now, now the next time like well, Spring Boot 2 is end of life, right? The next time there's like a major zero day security vulnerability discovered in Spring Boot 2, are you going to be able to move to Spring Boot 3? Or are you going to be stuck? And ironically, the thing that could keep you stuck is the fact that your unit tests haven't moved to JUnit 5 yet. So I think, okay, so move to JUnit 5. How hard can that be, right? And our temptation is to think, well, maybe this is stuff is stuff I can do with like find and replace. Because after all, like the, the JUnit author changed or JUnit before to, or JUnit Jupyter API before each. And so like I've got to basically go replace every like annotation before with before each. It's just like it's name change. It's like a different package that it went into. But there even like the changes can be super subtle. Like you can't use this run with annotation anymore in spring. Like you used to be able to define an exception on the test annotation. And now you got to use an assert throws and shove the rest of this method body into a Lambda. And, you know, oh, by the way, like I'm changing the imports here as well. And what if this was a wildcard import? Like, how would I know when I'm removing the assert false that like, that's an import that's getting pulled out of that wild card and like how many, so open rewrite is like way, 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 way beyond like a find and replace sort of mechanism. It's not like a regex thing. It's like, it's a rule-based system that's making really AST or syntax tree. We, we call it the loss of semantic tree because it's got other information about it. it. Changes, it's making changes to the tree level and then printing it back out to text. And as it prints it back out, it's making the changes look idiomatically consistent in the context of each repo the change is being inserted into. So in this case, this project uses wildcard imports only when there's five or more types. So you see that there's four import statements here. If there's one more that we get changed to a wildcard, you know, this one project uses tabs, so I got to use tabs. And so to make it look like a developer on this project handcrafted this change line by line. And it's a rule-based system. So it's a rule-based system that's guaranteed to make accurate change. No like AI stuff here, no fuzziness, right? Like it's guaranteed to make that accurate change. And I would have to, if I was a developer on this project, trying to move this project to JUnit 5, I would have to do this by hand, just over and over and over again. This kind of stuff just is absolutely soul-sucking, right? Like, I mean, who wants to do this? I, I signed up as a developer to be a creative, like an artist not like a, a guy that goes and does this kind of stuff. Like, and this is one repo. That's what amazes me, right? So think about that insurance company, 70 engineers, 3,000 repos. I got to do this 3,000 times? Or the alternative is I just get stuck on Spring Boot 2 forever. That's the reality, I think. So I think that's, that's where like, so this is the kind of like core idea of Open Rewrite is to be able to make that change at scale to make it look idiomatically consistent in the context of a bunch of repos that have different styles so that the developer can accept the change quickly and then move on. Do you have something you want to show for Modern as, as well? We, we have an open yeah. rewrite question. Maybe, maybe yeah. let's take that uh, question real quick and then... Yeah. So if we kind sure. of... And just we'll go back to the to the, the window here that's sharing. If I'm thinking about Modern, so if I'm if looking at Modern, Modern is like... It's, there's two editions, but there's a single tenant SaaS that we run isolated for each customer. This the edition that we're looking at right now, app.madarin.io, is, is, is an instance of Madarin that we run for about, you can see, 35,000 open source projects. Inside of this, this tenant is 2,000 Jenkins plugins, the entire Spring org, the entire Apache org, the entire Eclipse org. Um, the entire like, you know, uh, JUnit org, like, so we're pulling in like the most common stuff that we all depend on. And we also deploy recipes there. So I could take like one of these recipes, like and I'll go back to this one that this bank did, common static analysis. Common static analysis is a, is a, a recipe which has a bunch of other recipes attached to it that just do like sonar cube auto remediation. 
we even tag them with the equivalent sonar cube issue. So like sonar cube says, you shouldn't do this non-compliant compliant. We will rewrite this rule as an open rewrite recipe that both finds and auto fixes that issue and add it to this pile. So this pile just keeps growing, you know, of various things. And so I have, I've selected 38 repos in my org, my open source org right now. If I dry run this, the idea here, the reason I'm able to do this really fast is because in Modern, I pre-parsed all this code in that lossless semantic tree form. So then I can, I can rip over it with recipes really super quickly. If I was doing this with open rewrite to run this recipe, I would have to compile each one of these repos from scratch to parse it into an LST. So this would take probably hours to do. Just with open rewrite, I'm able to do here in a few seconds. You know, if I'm developing a new recipe to be able to iterate this fast is super important. If I look at one of these changes, like, you know, I could say like, well, what's going on here? Why did this change? Well, you know, unnecessary parentheses, cool, got it. You know, what what is this other thing? You know, like all these kinds of things. And so as a developer, the goal here would be that I could actually select all of these and say commit. And I'm gonna to commit to 16 repos with my credentials. So it's gonna show up as I'm the author, Modern is a co-author, or I could issue PRs or I could, you know, that kind of thing. But like, I am doing work very efficiently. I'm fixing these issues across all 16 repos at the same time. That's kind of the goal. Yeah. It, and we're talking to some Develocity great enterprise customers that want to do similar stuff. How can this help our customers? Yeah, I think one of the great stories with Develocity is like, you know, once Develocity is available to one of the, to an organization, a new customer of Gradle, to get the most out of it, they've got to configure that Develocity plugin in their builds. Well, they've got a lot of builds. So that is very much a change, you know, that, that you need to do. So I, I could look at for Develocity here. And, you know, there's an add the Develocity Gradle plugin at some particular version to the build. And, you know, I could then execute this on hundreds or thousands of repositories. Ta-da, suddenly they're all using build cache. They're all using test distribution. They're all like, they're all like immediately realizing the benefits of Develocity as opposed to like waiting for this to be installed one at a time on each repository. That's awesome. Hey, can we get Clay in here? Clay, can we use this uh, to this technology to, for example, enable Develocity for local builds? The cool custom values, the tagging and whatnot. So we, we update some stuff. We could roll that out with Modern. Exactly right. Um, we want to, you know, we have tricks we use to try to make this easier for people, but ultimately the way we want people to connect builds to Develocity is to touch every source repo with this configuration that allows the upload of build scans to Develocity, right? So th then you run into issues, you come into a large organization with thousands of source repositories, Develocity could give them the data on where they should focus their efforts to optimize those builds, but we need to connect those builds first to get that data. So you, you get this chicken and egg problem that's, that's very elegantly solved when you can do something like this. Well, but yes, uh, amazing, amazing. Uh, let's take, uh, we had an interesting question from the audience, Clay. Yeah. Uh, let's, you, you want to share that with John? Yeah, sure. Um, so someone asked uh, from the, the perspective of an, an organization developing uh, optimization software for automotive and space, code base is a million lines long. Uh, this this person wants, they, they say it's written in Java, using a swing uh, swing as a front end, um, mm -hmm. wanting to understand the, the concrete things that, that Open Rewrite gives them there. Yeah, so once you've identified a pattern, like whether that be a performance pattern, a security pattern, a modernization pattern, whatever it is that you would like to see applied through your code base, you kind of like, just like as developers, we always encapsulate things we know, you encapsulate that knowledge in a recipe and you can apply it. I remember talking to one principal engineer at one point, he said, I feel like I'm going around telling my kids to pick up their socks all the time, right? Like I'm getting like, I've got this idea of what I want my code base to look like. Well, like I, and I train the devs that have come on board to my team, but then like, but then I get another crop of devs the next year, or, you know, I'm getting code from a consultant or from an acquisition or, you know, and so I'm just, it's just constant. And so I want them to think, you know, what if you could like automate the picking up of socks to the point where like 
you're going to run it today to, to like pick up all the socks, but then you're probably going to run it in perpetuity to slam the door shut on that issue too. It never comes back. Um, I think that's kind of the, the potential. Play, we got one more uh, that's interesting. Let's take that and then we move on to our last two topics. Yeah, the, the, this, there's a specific question here. I may, I may generalize it a bit as well. Um, someone in, in the Q&A asked if Open Rewrite contains uh, recipes for upgrading query DSL. Um, I think what may also be an interesting thing to talk about is th there's a lot of potential here. What, where can I go to see what is already available? What, what can I already just grab and use? Yeah, yeah. Query DSL. I'm trying to think of what that is. Do you do, do you have like are you? Well, we we have a link. We we can we can yeah. save that for we can put a pin on that uh, and come back to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in general, anything though that you can really describe step to step. And it may be a multi-step operation. You know, if you can think about the problem algorithmically, you can do it probably. So, I mean, at the, what if the, I think if I think about boundaries, right? Any, anything you can describe like by steps you do, anything that involves like a creative exercise, I don't think you want to do with open rewrite. So I, I don't believe there will be a future where I take a 50 million line COBOL application and out comes a Java application that's fully modernized on the other side. I don't think that's realistic. I think you really need to consider that's a creative software building exercise right there. But then where is the line, right? Like, I mean, and the line cannot always be immediately apparent. If you have a hundred J2EE apps that use EJBs and you want to move to Spring Beans instead for those EJBs, I think in many cases that is something you can play in, in multiple steps. You implement another you know, concrete implementation of that EJB interface, you make it a bean, you inject it as a bean, you rip out the old thing. So like you can imagine how you would, you know, turn that into steps and execute it. That's, to me, that's what I always try to, like, I, I don't promise every kind of change. I promise the ones that you can think about systematically. Awesome. Um, and the audience, continue sending your, your questions in the Q&A. We're going to do more Q&A at the end. And uh, John, well, another interesting uh, story that, that you told us, you know, for you all, you use uh, Develocity as well. And yeah. and yeah. Open Rewrite is powered by Develocity. If anybody's interested in uh, the Open Rewrite Develocity instance, we can uh, show that. But John, you were talking about how you all, and you're going to have to correct me on this, as you all roll out Develocity, oh, or sorry, Open Rewrite, or Modern, it's a different configurations and projects and whatnot, you want to check to see how well it's going, if it broke anything, yeah. you want to check. I, I, I think I might have botched that a, a bit. No, no, no. Play no. can say there. it better. But yeah, uh, yeah. You, want, you want to talk about that a bit? And, and I yeah, don't know if we you have. have this, we have this really difficult challenge that if if we could share, yeah, it's, it's screen's being shared. Like we've got code as text, right? That's what's in GitHub. That's what's in Bitbook. It's code as text. But that text is a very lossy representation, right? Like if I'm looking at this P method right here, the method call, what is P? Where is it defined? You know, so if I want to change a particular method called P across my entire code base, I've got to be able to differentiate P's that come from the receiver type I care about versus P's that come from some other type I don't care about. And that's not visible in the text of the source code, right? When the compiler goes to compile that code, the compiler knows it has to solve for where P comes from. And that's called type attribution. So we turn this text into a syntax tree. A lot of security tools now are doing syntax tree searching. So they could find methods called P, but they couldn't tell whether that P came from list or whether it came from some other type. Like they don't really know. For open rewrite, we capture what's called the lossless semantic tree, which is the syntax plus everything the compiler knows and has solved for about all of those references, plus all the white space of the original code so we can preserve its formatting and style, plus a bunch of other information we stuff onto it at the end about like the class path and other things. And so this representation, super information dense, that's the thing that it's essential to us making significant change. But what it basically, and that's a long way of saying like, what that means then is we have to successfully execute the compiler on code, all of the code. Like, you know, in the case of that open source tenant, we're talking 40,000 repositories. 
40,000 repositories that use different Java versions, they use different Gradle versions, that use different Maven or Gradle, use both, use Bazel, use that, don't have any build tool, use and the variations are just absolutely enormous, right? And so if I were going to try to embark on, frankly, this is kind of almost like, you have to think I'm a bit crazy for even trying this. Like, what if I could just build any arbitrary project? by discovering all the like constraints that are required in selecting the appropriate thing, it almost feels like an impossible problem. But like that is the, that's the problem we signed up for. I'm going to parse 40,000 projects I don't control and got to do that successfully. So we, you know, we add as much logic as we can think of, but then overnight, say 20,000 of those projects fail. Why? Why? Like what, what was the most, what is the next most important thing I could do to improve that success rate. And so, you know, great thing from Gradle, they offered a Develocity instance to open a rewrite, and we hooked up all of those parsing builds every night to Develocity. And early on, we were do we were using Develocity's failure analysis to always identify the next most common source of failure when we were attempting to compile and parse a project into an LST. And so then like there's gonna be a long tail of like individual problems, but we can just always prioritize the next most important thing, next most important thing, next most important thing. And I kind of think that tool is amazing for uh, like productivity teams to like not get distracted by a problem they're interested in, but be able to prove like this is the most common failure in my organization. If I want to make an impact, this is probably the most important thing for me to actually try to you know, figure out and, and solve for it. And, and, and Clay, you can, uh, for the Zoom audience, if you want to share the Develocity instance of Open Rewrite, uh, uh, what's the URL again, uh, John? It's g.openrewrite.org. Yeah. Easy. Easy. Yeah. Maybe Clay, put put that in the chat. And, and, you, all, and you all use, uh, you, you mentioned build scans as one of your... Yep. It, your favorite features in there and how you all use that for, you know, uh, using, so you're using that internally and externally. Yeah, we're using that. Sure. We are parsing, we are compiling 40,000 open source projects we don't control every night. And, you know, if I had my way, I'm going to make that 400,000 a year from now, right? Like we're just like, our appetite is seriously large. And so things like, Develocity's build cache, like that stuff, it's like the difference between it being very computationally expensive and something that's computationally feasible for us to do without like spending oodles and oodles of money on that. So made a big difference in all, in helping us serve the open source community. And, uh, you know, t we, we like stories like one of the one of my favorite stories from 2023 was our old friend Steve Hill from Netflix starting to write recipes open rewrite recipes that would modernize Jenkins plugins. Because if you have an old version of a Jenkins or a Jenkins version that's pinned to an old version of Jenkins and you deploy it to a Jenkins master, a new Jenkins master, Jenkins will do weird stuff like automatically add dependencies to the runtime to try to backfill all the stuff that's been ripped out, like which could be super destructive to things on its left and right. And so if you just kept the plugins moving forward, it would actually take a lot of load off of these Jenkins masters. Well, there's like thousands of these, right? So it, you can understand why CloudBees is like, I'm not responsible for modernizing like 5,000 Jenkins plugins that's the like random people like built and then abandoned, but they kind of should be because it's their ecosystem, right? So Steve started building these recipes and he's working with CloudBees. They've made hundreds of commits to like plugins that are in their kind of space that have otherwise been abandoned to actually modernize them and move them forward. That's the kind of stuff I love seeing. Like that's going to benefit all of us that use Jenkins, right? You know, because of the work of like one, one person in one of those companies. That's awesome. And, and we're coming kind of to, to the end of our time together. Um, Clay, any, any other uh, interesting questions we could think? Yeah, sure. We, we've got one more here in the, the channel asking about what it, takes like so how easy is it to integrate a new language into open rewrite yeah yeah it's a really good question um and languages are something that's like top of my mind and one of the things that i, tr I try to focus on quite a bit now um we've discovered that there's these things called grammar islands of self-similar languages like there's like the c family of languages approximately like java group kotlin 
C++, C Sharp, Ruby, believe it or not, Ruby, Python, JavaScript, all kind of sit on that same island. At the LST level, this tree level that we were showing earlier, like they, they kind of look the same. In the syntax, like when you see them in text, they look very different. The way they're printed out to text looks very different. And so, I, you know, I just about finished the Ruby uh, LST. You can see that out there in the open source org right now. That actually extends from the Java base LST, believe it or not, surprisingly, maybe controversially. And so some of the common recipes I've written for Java just automatically work on Ruby code. Um, so there's some like lift that we get from prior investments when the new language we're adding is on that, uh, is in that same island. But in general, like what it, involves is building a parser, building a parser from the internal compiler LST to, or AST to this open rewrite LST. And, you know, that's just work that, that we need to do. So, um, C sharps on my mind, um, by June, um, you can see JavaScript and Python parsers out there in open source right now. Those need a little bit more TLC. I think Ruby is, uh, also something very close to being done now. What, what are your, I, I got one for you, John, what are your yeah. customers? What, what do they love the most? You know, and I'm talking about uh, the modern customers. What are they like? Hey, I, I really think it's that, and I'm going to use this phrase again. It's like tech stack liquidity. It's the, you, you take an exercise that feels impossible, even if it's like Java 8 to 17. And if you can, if you can build a program for it, you can plan to actually get that work done, like without a substantial cost overrun, without like, you know, like I'm getting, I get 30% of the way through this and the business priority shifts. And now like I'm, you know, that's, that really makes it hard, you know, for, for organizations to move forward. And so I think it's to a business being able to move off of a technology onto another one, to be able to modernize your stack has like a lot of effects. I mean, it simplifies your overall architecture. It means you can negotiate with your vendors. You now are no longer like locked in and stuck. You can move, which means they don't come back to you with a huge price increase knowing that you're stuck, right? I mean, it's just a lot of like downstream effects. I think of that ability to move. And I, I love that. One of the things I really love, and, we, you know, we work with some of the largest organizations um, as customers. I really feel like there should be a shift in responsibility for break and change from the end users of frameworks back to the framework authors. So when I worked on the spring team and I made a breaking change that impacted every user of my, of my framework downstream, right? I, I made the decision to break it, right? But that's going to affect everyone. So if I'm going to make a breaking change, I should also be responsible for providing the recipe that fixes everyone downstream of me. And I, I want it to be like a competitive differentiator for a framework. If you're the Quarkus team who writes recipes, if you're the Micronaut team who writes recipes, like it means that if I use Micronaut, I'm not going to have to suffer through the next break and change. Like they're going to provide some automation for me. That's a reason I choose that framework over another one. And um, if you're a vendor that wants to like onboard customers more quickly, like we talked about with DevVelocity plugins, that's a way for you to like get in, in your, you know, expand inside the customer base a lot more quickly. I think that's really important. And so when we work with large customers, if you think like big banks, an engineer at a big bank doesn't often feel cool, right? They like look up to the, the Google engineer or the Netflix engineer and say, oh, these guys are cool, but I'm over here at this kind of legacy organization. That legacy organization has a ton of power to say, hey, I have 10,000 apps written on top of Spring Boot and I'm a customer of VMware's or, you know, Broadcom or whatever. Like they need to, they owe me. Right, they owe me recipes that move me forward, or I can put spend at risk somewhere else in the portfolio. And so I want to see that responsibility shift back to you know to, to really to benefit us all. Well, you're surely doing it, John. I, I hear a lot of folks uh, uh, talking about your product, and you got that uh, Amazon reinvent <laughs> momentum yeah. there. And, uh, That's right. Uh, 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 thanks everyone, kind of for joining us. Uh, we have some stuff coming up for you next. Our next DPE lowdown is with the folks from Copilot. AI has been super hot, and you know, Copilot folks are are doing so. They're going to share some of their customer case studies and success stories and how they their customers have improved developer productivity. I've heard a few as well that I'm going to throw in there. Um, that one we have in March. You can sign up for it on on uh, gradle.com or this QR code here. Uh, uh, John, you have some good stuff as well. 
um, coming up. You you got your folks can get the the open rewrite book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, certainly just reach out to me and I'll send one to you. But you know, I've got like five hundred of them in my closet over here. But uh, yeah, it's a, a little little tiny O'Reilly book on automated code remediation, which I want folks to really understand that concept and be able to communicate it to their business. And, and you all can get that from uh, Modern IO and. If yeah. you, you you want more information, uh, that's uh, John's website. If you want to learn more about Modern and the stuff that they do, um, you can go there. And we we have some great old stuff as well. We we got uh, you can sign up for our Developer Productivity Engineering newsletter. You we have uh, you can try out a, a free build scan to see what kind of data we we capture. Uh, there it is, uh, uh, right there. The Developer Productivity Engineering uh, newsletter. We have a handbook uh, on it as well. So we have some cool stuff for folks that want to get more into developer productivity engineering. And uh, I, I think that's it. Let's uh, let everybody get back to uh, their next meeting in, in seven minutes. John, thanks again for joining. Thank Clay, you for having me. Thanks for uh, jumping on and helping and providing support. And uh, John, we'll, we'll see you soon. Yeah, see you soon. Thank you, folks, and we'll see you all next time.